Oh, you did it so beautifully. See, she's like a granddaughter to me because my sweetheart, my wife, that I've been with now going on 60 years, she was sitting beside me. I'm reviewing this now. You've heard it, but there's a few here that haven't heard this. There's some ministers here this afternoon that haven't heard this. Uh, but I've been walking with God a few decades, and uh, my wife was right here, and I was praying. And all once the Holy Spirit revealed to me a light that I was to see a precious young man that was in our congregation in 1938, 39, 40, 41. I married them on a Sunday morning after I preached in 1940. Uh, no one knew it was going to happen in December 1940. So I, I told my wife, I said, this is a light in him, the Holy Ghost. So I went to find him. And when I found him, he and his pastor and their wives had prayed night after night after night for an evangelist to be sent of God. Now, the pastor was up in years. He knew many evangelists throughout the country, the United States. But he said, you send someone that you want that I don't know. So, of course, I didn't know him. He didn't know me. And I didn't know this anyhow. And I found him, and he stopped his big bulldozer. Uh, this young man that was with us so many years ago brought us a pound of butter every week. He didn't have much money. And... Uh, he looked at me and he told me, he said, my heart was so stirred when I saw you. He said, my heart was just stirred up. I hadn't seen him for I don't know how long. So we talked for about an hour and 23 minutes. Shared, I don't know all the Lord had to do. Like when I talked with you. Never talked before. A lovely sister. The Lord told me as badly as I wanted to take you, I couldn't take you to Israel. Like you were to stay home and preach. And God gave you one of the most wonderful revivals in that church you'd had since you were young. And here you and I had then long talk for two hours and 28 minutes. And I, I didn't really uh, know what to say. Only I thought I'd just say, well, Daniel, I'm so thankful to talk with you and how I've loved your father since 1970 and your sister's like a daughter to my wife and me and your mother is one of my close sisters. I, I thought we'd just talk a little but before I knew it I talked to you and I just shared one thing right after the other and in two hours and 28 minutes what had happened? Well all of the questions that I had about your ministry because I was familiar with you and my family they were in this and their lives had taken a turn and I wondered about that and knew that someone individual had had quite a profound influence on their lives and I had questions about it and some information that had been shared with me outside the family circle was not accurate and uh, it smelled fishy because what I was hearing didn't uh, coordinate with what I saw in these changed lives. So I had questions, questions about the uh, things that have been said. And uh, in the course of our conversation on the telephone, the Lord helped you to answer every one of the questions thoroughly and completely enough and in such a way as uh, it left no doubt in my mind as to uh, your legitimacy in all of those areas made perfect sense to me all of these things and uh, the Lord just did a wonderful thing he through that wonderful. for me too. me also it was so precious a time yeah. that we couldn't explain just how dear it was to anyone true because of his presence like here this morning his presence this morning was says that yes. my wife wanted to know how everything was and I, uh, Richard came in you know he's been with me for 25 six years and he said I think it was one of the most wonderful services I've been in for a while uh, or I don't know how long and we couldn't uh, tell one another we could not tell our companions how Jesus helped us in those two hours and 28 minutes yes that's right oh you could never explain it no, it's beyond us. 
For that which is of man can be explained, but that which is of the Holy Spirit can never be told accurately in a way that will convey its beginning, actuality, of how it took place. And all because of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, of the mighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. And then when we, get, you know, when we went to Luxembourg, what a time we had. Oh, it was precious. Oh, yes. It was a precious time. Wonderful fellowship. Precious time. In the Lord. Precious and, time. And uh, the time that we had there, because we'd only known you, really, in person a few days. Just, just a few days. And through that trip, we were able to observe what you preached and taught and wrote in The Voice in the Wilderness, because I had had the privilege of reading it at that time. We saw that it wasn't simply uh, a literary work, it wasn't word, just words, it wasn't high-sounding platitudes and uh, something that was one thing on the page and another thing in shoe leather. We saw a wonderful consistency, the Jesus. fact that the life matched the proclamation. And we were so stirred and appreciative. And again, what the Lord gave us in fellowship there and what he did in our hearts, it, yes. uh, only those who have experienced it, and many of you have, would know because we can't tell about it, can't yes, explain it, it in like words. It just has grateful. to be experienced. Yes, yes, experienced. Oh, what a joy. I would come home to my Amen. wife maybe 50 years ago, and I'd say, oh, I wish I had six to 12 men with me today to get in one of what I was in. Maybe I was in a home or a grocery store or a filling station or out in a farm or a barnyard. I just saw one of my friends that's been close to me for 47 years. And I went up there and we'd have meetings, you know, God help us in the cow shed and in the, in the barnyard and in the front hall of the house in a wheat field. And oh, what a time, God help us. I'd tell my wife in various places, maybe I'd be near Whitewater or Middleborough, or maybe I'd be somewhere around Red Key. I said, oh, if I just had a few people with me today get in on this feast I've been in. And as I started to, to share about the hour and 23 minutes with this precious, uh, like a son to me at that time, very close to me, and then the revival began at his church. Because of that leading, we found Joy Bell. See, I found her through that guidance. See, we wouldn't have her. Probably see her find Jesus when she's four years and seven months old. The one that just played and sang so beautifully. And all these things don't just happen. And we want to give God the praise for how he directs and guides. Because he told Israel, he wanted to review in the morning and at noon and at night uh, what he had been doing for them review that day, that week, that month, that year, what he had been uh, giving them, sharing with them, the leadership, the blessing, the direction, the revelation, the help, the wonder that they saw in the Red Sea, in the River Jordan, and, uh, uh, and the fear that came upon them when the house of Korah that did that which they ought not, and the earth just opened up and swallowed the whole family. And then just a little bit later, 250 men were consumed. Consumed means that they were there and suddenly they're gone. They're not in the ground, they're not in the air, they're consumed. It said 250 consumed. That's four or five verses from the time of the rebellion of, of Korah and what he had done in the record there on. And he said, you review what I've done for you. He did miracles, wonderful things to encourage them and to help them and to lift them and to heal them. And I can't recall all, but he wants us to review. So we wouldn't have had joy, but if hadn't been for that guidance on that highway in August of 55. And I, I thought about how significant that was. What if I hadn't have pressed? Because I couldn't find him for a while. I'd be keep pressing. See, in all the revelations or the guidances that God has given me for now going in 60 years is I've had to press constantly to get through to what he had led me to do. 
So I had to persevere, press, not get discouraged, just praise the Lord and keep right on going Amen. Amen. until it came to pass. And I'm not press in a carnal way, but press in a spiritual step so that it is uh, not repugnant, but it is uh, helpful, encouraging. You mean when the Lord leads you, things don't just fall into place? Uh, no. Many times I have to persevere through different situations. And so and many people think that when the Lord, if it opens a door, that's it. Well, you can't go by that. You go by the inner revelation of his presence. As when the district superintendent told me in 1937, in February, he said, now, Lauren, you may go to Mill Grove Circuit. It's the closest to Teddy University. It has a fair parsonage, and it's not too many miles away. Now, he said, I have another circuit for you. It's Winchester Circuit, and it has an extra parsonage. It has a few more dollars for you. They both pay $800. And I said to Dr. A. Wesley Pugh, I said, well, Thank you very much, but I don't get any word from the Lord. Well, he said, I have one more left, and that's Red Key Circuit. But he didn't think I wanted it. He said, I don't want to pay $700. I said, well, Dr. Pugh, when you say Red Key Circuit, God tells me that's the place. And he said, he said, no, I think you've answered too quickly. Take about 24 hours to think this through and pray about it. I said, no, Doctor, I said, when God speaks to me and shows me something, it never changes. It doesn't alter. I was 21 years old at that time. And so I called him back. <clears throat> See, I had to persevere through there because this great man of God, I mean, he is a precious man, one of the leading men, and, and really was a great Christian, great follower of Jesus, and so was the pastor. They were both dedicated. And my pastor preached that after we're saved, we need to be cleansed of the carnal nature and filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it'd been happy if I'd gone to Mill Grove Circuit because it was near Tell University. It was a nice people. But you see, I didn't, I couldn't go by the, what it appeared to be, beautiful people and, and convenient and helpful, more money. I had to go by the guidance of the Holy Spirit in my heart. And by going to Red Key Circuit, by going there for much less money compared to today, because 700 then is worth a number of thousands today, uh, 50 some years ago, 55 years ago. Listen, you can buy almost a sack of groceries then for the dollar. Of course, I worked all week for a dollar. 31, 32, 33, and 34. I was happy. Praise the Lord. And uh, I called Dr. Back and I said to him, I said, God has revealed to me I'm to take this place called Red Key Circuit. I don't know anybody there, but that's where I'm supposed to go. And when I arrived there, I was so happy, I, I couldn't have been happier in the White House. And that's what wasn't my last pastor. We didn't have any furnace, either place. Didn't have any stove, either place. Didn't have a bathroom, either place. Had to go outside for your facilities. You had to pump your water outside, too. Like that, my last pastor. But I was happy. For a long way of running water inside. You know, if you just keep persevering, God will bring you water and the dry, thirsty anticipation. And I had been preaching there about five or six weeks when a dear mother in Israel, when I would preach, the tears would slowly trickle down her cheeks. She didn't, she didn't make any noise. She was quiet like. She's not like me. I get happy sometimes and shout. And... Um, See, I was opposed to shouting. Any demonstration, I didn't like that. For my conversion. I don't want that at all. Now, when you oppose that, when you get it, that's what you get. 
Now you see, if I had just accepted it, well, I might not have ever shot it in my life. People that don't want to cry, they become criers. People that want to cry, they don't shed a tear. He, he always gives us what we need. Because that will help someone sometime. And this precious saint told my wife, this would be 54 years ago. I guess it would be 55 years now. She said, you know, I have prayed for your husband's ministry at this church for 30 years. That was eight years and eight months before I was born. Seven months and eight months. Seven years and eight months before I was born. Now, I thought that was, that was remarkable. And he told me how to revival. And you know that was one of the greatest revivals that been in that church maybe then for 50 years? Because of the Holy Spirit, his guidance, his revelation, how Jesus saved souls, how he transformed believers, how he made homes to become a, a unit of, of, of his presence, his joy. And to know Christ and to know God and follow him by the Holy Spirit is what we, that's church. That's worship. That's the kingdom. If he isn't leading, it's just a group of people acting religious. See, if he isn't leading, if we're not denying self and cleanse of the carnal nature and willing to follow and obey him, and you have a group of people like that, we just arrange it ourselves. And when we arrange it ourselves, the, the people that are starved to death, there's nothing on the table. But it doesn't make much how feeble we are, as I'm so feeble, limited, knowing so little. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a student. I'm only a servant. But he can take a little servant, this noising, and feed persons, their souls and their hearts, and give them inspiration and joy. Feed their hearts until they feel like springtime even though it's dark or winter. When the Holy Spirit leads, it's fresh. Yes. Fresh as morning. It's like birds singing. It's like the rippling of streams, the fragrance of flowers. It's like a marble of the meadow at morning time as the lark is peeling out the singing and the song of the whippoorwill at evening time. So it really is a marvelous thing to let God lead and there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. As we trust and obey, then, uh, oh, we become like a child. It, I found out that only those that are childlike trust him with all their heart and lean not to their own understanding. You see, most of us are leaning to our own understanding. The more we know, the more we have to die to keep from what we know of guiding us. The more we know, the more we have to die yes. to self in order to do his will instead of letting what we know reason it through and arrange it. Well, that's worth the whole waiting upon God if we're able to hear it and believe it. And never forget it. Never. Because otherwise, you see, God wanted to lead Israel. And Israel, as you read... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. You see as you read that the children of Israel, they complained and they murmured. And there was only two men and 603,000 that obeyed God. Of the men above the age of 20 years that entered into Canaan. Only two, Joshua and Caleb. I said that 49 years ago. In the next few months, I said, Lord, if only two of the natural branches make it into Canaan, which is the victorious life, which is the spirit-led life, which is the joyful going after Jesus, if only two made it in there, out of 603,000, how about we of the wall out of tree grafted in by faith? I said that as I'd read the word 49 years ago. Of course, I started the word in my life way back in the late teens and early 20s. 
the scripture you read to me. But I didn't know Jesus until January the 22nd, 1933. So I passed 59 going unto 60. And I have to die out from morning to night to myself, to the human. I say, get behind me, Satan. See, the devil is trying to get us out of order constantly. The self, the human, the powers of the air, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. It appears to be good, but we must have help to escape the pitfall of trusting the best we know. Of the knowledge we've acquired because the knowledge we've acquired will speak so loudly that we w it'll smother out what God is leading us to that leading can't get through because we're so filled with self and human humanity that he wants to lead us and reveal it to himself to us but we just we have to persevere we've got to die daily and praise the Lord much now if we don't we rejoice quite a bit will backslide because the word said you ever rejoice all way and again I say rejoice how much is that that doesn't exclude very much time does it always rejoice evermore you see we don't rejoice even when it's difficult when we're lonely when we're disappointed and when we're hurt and uh, things are difficult we don't rejoice then See, that's the evidence of Christianity, that we love one another as Jesus loves us, and that we rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. Oh, Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ, the King. And I come short there. I come away behind. Because we're to rejoice. We sing, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior sometime in the day long. No. The songwriter said all day. Now, if we rejoice all day, how much time is that? If we rejoice all day, listen, if we rejoice all day, how much of room is there for complaint? If we rejoice in the Lord all day, how much room is there to find fault with anybody? Well, there is, of course, isn't it true? Yes, if we rejoice all day. Now, the rejoicing heart doesn't have to press to do it. He does it as a fruit of dying to obey. Now, if we can get that, it'd be worth coming around the world. Well, it sure would. If we could hold on to it, praise the Lord. Now, because it's a fruit of dying to self and obeying the Holy Spirit, doing what Jesus wants us to do in simplicity and not in fanaticism. being childlike and just letting the Lord guide don't seek the guidance don't seek the revelation simply follow by dying when we seek then we're apt to be in the flesh and get that which is not appropriate for the time so we must go slow Remember when you and I talked about going slow? Well, I remember it very well. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, and I said, we go slow, and then we go slower. See, it's a tendency of us to go rapidly. We want to copy something. We want to build a church. We want to get thousands, hundreds, scores. Well, if we get them, without the leading of the Holy Spirit, they'll become in by Caesarean birth. And they're born with a trustless heart. See, we get out and get people saved, and we just work with them. And unless the Holy Ghost has drawn them in there, they'll be born with a trustless heart. I never read that in any book. And then you have problems. You've got fusses in the church. You've got complaint. See, anybody's born with a trustless heart, they complain about this, and they murmur about that, and they talk about this one, and they judge that one. But you have someone that's born with a trusting heart that's obedient. 
and he just rejoices. He rejoices, praise the Lord. You don't hear any complaints. You don't hear any murmuring. You don't hear any judgmental spirit. You just see a childlike soul that's floating along, following. Praise the Lord. I didn't know we were going to get into this. Rich. Came out of the fact that we found Joy Bell. We've been in this for 30 minutes. Because she ended her playing or, or 30 minutes ago. 31 to, about 31 minutes ago. And so to do God's will is everything. To do God's will. See, he didn't want me to take the other two pastors. Some more money, more nice things. He wanted me to take the lesser. And then he gave me more. Oh, it's in my heart. And it's still coming through. See, I'm still getting it. It's, it's, it's in various parts of the United States because I went there. Because we went there where Jesus told me to go when I was 21 years old. 55 years ago. He gave the revelation 55 years ago in February. And it's still on. We just enjoyed one of the most beautiful renditions of, of the piano playing. This is one of the most wonderful instruments in the world. Some of you that just came in the last two sessions, uh, John Light, your brother, John Stan, please. Thank you. It's through him we have this instrument here. Uh, tell them the name of this instrument because we have dear ones here that don't know about this instrument here that we just heard beautiful tones and music and rippling of wonderful inspiration in the realm of a enjoyment that we can't explain. Yes, it's a, it's a Bersendorfer, nine foot, six inch Imperial Grand made in Vienna, Austria. Uh, this one is stationed here in Chicago for famous pianists that, that uh, come to Chicago and play. I forgot to mention the other day it has 97 keys. It doesn't have 88 keys. And uh, it takes how many years to build it? About four years. It takes four years to build this instrument. Yes, it's built by hand, basically. Yes. And there isn't any other piano, really, that compares with this because it's, it's made uh, by hand by uh, certain rules and laws of putting things together that brings forth tones like I hear here. Yes. Yes, the, the men who build these pianos, in, in Vienna, you can get what they call it your papers. And uh, you have to apprentice for three years full time with no pay in order to be eligible then to take your tests to get your papers to work to build this piano. And that's what I hear. See, I hear such magnificent tones. Yes. I hear, I wish, you see, when we go home and we go to churches and we don't hear that, we're going to miss that. <laughs> See, because it has tones that I never heard in my 70, going on 77 years. It has a mellow richness, a resonance, as you told us, you know, in the letter months ago. Yes. And for us to be privileged to have this instrument I, here. I would like to say one thing. I don't, I don't want to give anybody the idea. It's here for anyone to play. You cannot hurt the instrument. Uh, I've had people come up to me and say, would it be okay if I touched the piano? It's here to play. And if you can play chopsticks, try to play them on this piano. See, it's, we are honored to have the company allow us this privilege of having this because if it were to be sent to a concert hall, it would cost how much? The, the delivery, the fellows who delivered it, they would normally charge about $700. And it came here? Free. Because, by God's grace, the company has appreciated you so much and you have done so much for the company that they would allow us to have this uh, beautiful instrument. Well, the, the letters probably did most of the trick. Yeah, the three or four hundred letters we sent in appreciation yes. uh, to this organization. Because I think you told me the first time we did this, they were rather in shock. Yes. Uh, they were astonished to get yes, the letters of appreciation. Yes, the general manager said, now, John, I'm not going to have to answer all of these. Anyway. <laughs> and so, 
uh, this instrument costs to build now $120,000. Since June the 1st, it's Since June the 1st, 120000 And uh, the ordinary man, the working man on the farm, he, you have to work a long time to ever save that much. Yes. yes. Especially since the farmer gets about one third what's supposed to be his. Yes. Uh, my burden is for the American farmer. He's getting just about one third or less than what's his. That's true. I didn't know I was going to get on that, but I slipped on that note <laughs> before right. I knew it was going to occur. <laughs> That's on the keyboard of observation. Yes. <laughs> And so we were privileged because of God helping you. And then when you returned back home, last waiting upon God, you got a call from, Ste was it Steinway? Yeah, when I got back from the last waiting on God, I left almost immediately for a, a national piano technicians conference. Yes, and I think that you got information from, was it Steinway that called you and said that they, they met with me there and asked me if I would be interested in, in uh, take, they have a new line of piano out called a Boston piano. And, and uh, they asked me if I would be interested in uh, taking the, the head technical job for the United States, Canada, and Europe. But it, and your office would have been on Fifth Avenue in New York? Yes. But you declined to stay down <laughs> with your brother down in that <laughs> precious little place to... It was, it was no trade. <laughs> it was no trade. No, no. You said you weren't even... You, you didn't think about it at all. You just said, it, no, no it's... Uh, I'm not interested. I, well, I didn't say it, I'm not interested. I said, I want you to know it's an honor, Great honor. That, that you would ask me to do this, but I'm happy. Yeah, happy where you are. I'm happy where I am. So thankful. Praise the Lord. Oh, we give him praise and thanksgiving. That's great. Would you come to the platform now and lead us in a song? Let's all stand. fountain filled with blood but, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Would you like for me to have a pian pianist? Beverly, Beverly, would you come if you please and play? Thank you. You know, uh, there was a meeting and uh, D.L. Moody was to preach that morning. It was very early in Indianapolis and uh, it was kind of dead. Uh, wasn't in the life there. And Moody was going this way and that way, and he said he wished that they could get something going as uh, early in the morning. And so in the congregation was Ari de Sanke. And someone said, Sanke, sing. Maybe God will use you to wake up the place. And so he arose and began to sing. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from a manual vein. Oh, he, just the power of the Holy Ghost went all over the place. And Moody went right to him as soon as the service over. He said, I've been looking for you for years. You're going to be with me. He said, no, I have a, I have a job with the Commerce Department of the State of Indiana. He said, you're going with me. I've been looking for you for years. <laughs> One time, you know, they were in London, just outskirts, preaching to the gypsies. And they, they were preaching uh, the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb, and and those gypsies who were hearing him being saved, you know. And all at once, R.D. Sankey put his hand out on a little Indian boy. He said, may the Lord God of Israel make an evangel of thee. And uh, I don't know how many decades went by. I don't know whether it was 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. And in New York City, R.D. Sankey was then up in years. And uh, to that town came an evangelist. And he was taking him over the great city. So this evangelist said to him, he said, do you remember many years ago when you and Mr. Moody was preaching the gospel of the outskirts of London and you put your hand out on the head of a little gypsy boy 
Oh, he recalled it. He said, I'm that little boy, Gypsy Smith. The music is still going on of truth and of love and of revelation of how God worked in their lives through the power of his presence of Jesus. So we're grateful. And when you said there's a fountain filled with blood, took me to uh, Emory Reese, that was our secretary for years, is still close to us, his son, our doctor, he's my medical doctor. He's here. And he may pray after a while, I don't know. But uh, I was praying with him on the 22nd day of February, 1950. And I, he wasn't getting the victory. And my wife began to play the piano. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And it's, he was swept right through the gates. Got the victory right there. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because of that great hymn, the Holy Spirit working through it and into his heart. So we want to give him praise and glory. When you said that, these all came to my mind a little at a time. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to you for standing and waiting, listening. Benjamin, would you come please to the piano? We found him because God led me to the Fifth Motel in August of 1951. And then for that leading, would have missed him. So thankful you could press your way here from Knoxville. And uh, good to see you, son. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, we're sure missing you. Uh, in the garden. 